Good evening and welcome to the Adam Smith Institute. Tonight we're looking at the future of the Union. 313 years since the kingdoms of England and Wales and that of Scotland were joined in Union and over 200 years since Ireland and a successor, Northern Ireland, joined uh, with the, the United Kingdom of Great Britain. Uh, we stand on the brink. Two decades since the advent of devolution, the United Kingdom uh, appears to be in a weak position with nationalists riding high in the polls in Scotland, an emboldened movement in Northern Ireland and a very online, angry, flag-waving, bridge-occupying force in Wales, which I deal with on a daily basis. Uh, what future then for our shared and united kingdom? Does the union have a future in its current form? Has devolution gone far enough or has it gone too far? And how will the union's future be decided? Who will get to decide it? And what should the offer be for young people and for the future of our kingdom. Tonight, I'm joined by, four, uh, by three other great uh, speakers on this particular issue. Um, I'm joined by Andrew Barry, the Conservative and Unionist MP for West Aberdeenshire and King Garden. I'm joined by um, Henry Hill, the Assistant Editor of Conservative Home, and Daniel Caporo, the French Bed Editor at The Telegraph. We are going to be discussing all of those issues. We'll be looking at it from an English, Welsh, Scottish, Northern Irish, and Republic of Irish, uh, point of view, as well as a British point of view, maybe even a bit of Gibraltarian from Daniel as well. Um, and I can see from some of the addresses of you guys tonight that you're joining us from right around the world, from New Zealand, Hong Kong, India, Greece, across the European Union, um, and America as well. Uh, so welcome to you all tonight. Um, I'm going to kick it off with Andrew Bowie, who has just joined us, um, who hopefully will give us a bit of perspective as to what's happening up in Scotland um, and what it means Oh, and a great flag, Andrew. Great flag. Love the uh, what it means, what it, what it means, uh, what, the, what the elections next year will mean for the United Kingdom and whether uh, the Union has a future. So go over to you, Andrew. Cheers, Matt. And uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure uh, to join you and everybody else this evening uh, to talk about a subject that seems to be at the top of everybody's uh, discussion uh, list at the minute, which is, of course, the future of our uh, United Kingdom. Um, the elections next May are uh, critically important, vitally important uh, to the future of our United Kingdom. The SNP, um, who are in minority government, uh, it might surprise a few people to learn at the minute, uh, have the potential, if they form a majority, uh, to uh, demand and use that as a platform, and then they would call a mandate to have a referendum of Scottish uh, independence, uh, an issue that many of us had hoped that we had settled uh, six years ago in uh, the referendum in 2014, which so famously uh, was uh, dubbed at the time to be once in a lifetime, once in a generation event in which 55% of Scots uh, who voted, uh, voted to remain in the United Kingdom. So uh, it, it, everybody on this call, I'm sure, will have seen recent polls which show that support for independence is uh, on the up, support for the SNP is on the increase, driven, I suspect, from the perception and it's no more than a perception of competence in the way that they've handled the coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, north of the border. Um, nationalism is, by, you know, by definition, a very tough uh, enemy to fight. Um, the, the SNP are an incredibly organised, well-oiled campaigning machine. And it's very hard to stop people being patriotic about their country. Uh, and when you tell them that this will give more powers to uh, your countrymen and that you yourself will be more empowered to control uh, certain aspects of your lives, that's a very tough argument to fight against. How we go about, you know, preserving the union, making the case of the union over the next few months and possibly over the next few years is very much to remind people of the stake that they have in the union, remind people, young people of the future that they might be able to have as a part of this United Kingdom, the fifth largest economy in the world, of successful countries in the history of the world. And that is, that is essentially what I hope and what I know that the government is going to be driving towards doing uh, over the next uh, few years. Uh, the union, you know, you said, it, it, I think, Matt, your words were, it is in peril. I, I don't know if I would go so, so far to say uh, it was in peril, but it's certainly uh, at, a, at, a, at a critical juncture in its history. And the next few months, we must, as conservative and unionists, uh, get right if we are to ensure that the 300-year-old history of our United Kingdom does not end and that we can go on flourishing uh, into the future. And I'll stop there because I know where we've got other people on the panel and I'm sure we'll be going back to some of those issues uh, later on. Thank you very much, Andrew. Henry, who is the editor, uh, the assistant editor at Con Home, 
You've taken a quite a hard line on the current approach to devolution in the United Kingdom um, and, and its impact on sort of the unitary state and the unitary identity of, of, of British people as a, as, a, as a nation in and of itself. Um, do you think that the union as it's currently composed is sustainable? Do you think that, uh, that the kingdom will um, has a future in, if it carries on the path of sort of ever more devolution down the line? No, um, the problem that we, the unionism has had, the unionism has had really for at least 20 years is that it has been an entirely piecemeal approach to the constitution, which involves trying to buy the nationalists off with constitutional concession after constitutional concession in the vague hope that eventually the problem just goes away. Now that manifestly hasn't happened and it's left us now defending the United Kingdom in 2020 in quite a weak position because the emotional ties of the union are weaker than they've been in a long time. Fewer people identify as British. Uh, those, uh, so that appeal is, is, is diminished. And at the same time, the union does less. You know, when we were defending, when, not me, but when the other side were defending the European Union during the EU referendum, one of the things they realized was they had to argue that the European Union does things. It enables things to happen. With the British Union, we increasingly don't have that because devolution has been taken forward to such an extent that the United Kingdom government has no say over education, very little to no say over healthcare. Lots of bread and butter issues that affect people's day-to-day -day lives simply don't take place in a British context, even when as especially in Wales, devolved performance in these areas has been performed and has been, has been incredibly poor. And the net result is that we've got this well-developed, I call it the Democrat dodge, which is that no matter what happens, no matter what the issue, they always shift the blame to Westminster and claim to, and try and accrue more power for themselves. Now, the problem we have at this juncture is that we're running out of road. There's increasingly little of the British state left to give away. Uh, advocates of ever more devolution end up proposing that they turn us into sort of a mini-me European Union, uh, where instead of uh, decisions being made by the British government for the, that happen on the British level, we have a council of ministers and everything takes place through international, uh, within the nation, you know, home nations horse trading. And I don't think that's going to work. I think that fundamentally, we have to not just win another Scottish referendum if there is one, but we need to recognise that our constitutional strategy hasn't been working and start to take the, the United Kingdom back towards a more sustainable, integrated and better integrated state. Fair enough. And Dan, you're, as, as he mentions, Henry mentions Wales. I think it's fair to bring you back in. You, you have in your little Twitter bio a, a nice amount of Welsh and also a little, little uh, Wales flag, the, uh, the Red Dragon. Um, do you think that do you think that devolution in Wales has, has been a success? Do you think actually that maybe we should be looking at more devolution in, a, in at the English level and lower down in localist level? Um, how does it how does this square with keeping the union together? So Wales is an odd one, isn't it? Because when um, devolution was put in place in the late nineties, Wales was the odd one out. It had very few powers was effectively just a second executive for Wales, which kind of meant that, that it was very pointless and it took sort of 15 years for, for Wales to get legislative power. Uh, since that's come in, um, they've been able to do more. But again, Wales is, is a strange one because it's not coherent in the way that Scotland is. North Wales is a very different place to South Wales. North Wales is very much um, integrated with the Northwest of England. Uh, South Wales has nothing at all to do with Manchester really. So it's a bit of a strange, um, polity to, to have devolution but I think where Wales is interesting so Henry mentioned um, you know that we're kind of at the limits and there's nothing left to give I think that's possibly true of Scotland you know in Scotland they, they, there's immense uh, levels of devolution there's very little that the Scottish government doesn't have a say over even when it comes to allocating the first 10 percent of, of VAT um, that's not true of other parts of the country um, when you look at Wales it's still for example, hunting, you know, strange things. Hunting is devolved to Scotland, hunting is not devolved to Wales. It's very sort of a very higgledy pig mess. Um, I think the issue is that devolution is a ratchet. You can't take powers back. People don't like things being taken away from them. If we're talking about wanting to keep Scotland in the union, to say you're going to have less devolved powers is, is, is a disastrous approach to take. Um, but I think that you can take a more coherent, holistic approach to this and to look at the entire country and say, let's stop this kind of drip by drip approach, a little bit of powers there, a little bit of powers here, and actually look at how we want to govern the United Kingdom as a whole. One of the strange side effects of, of devolution in Scotland is that Scotland itself as a country has become highly centralized. The SNP has moved a lot of powers to Edinburgh, taking them away from local councils. Um, 
obviously now it'd be very different for the West, difficult for the Westminster government to get involved in, in, in local powers in Scotland. But there is an argument to say that there should be more power, you know, there should be some kind of uh, devolved body in the Highlands, for example. Um, but there's, there's a possibility to take a more coherent national approach where devolution is the same across all areas. Obviously, Northern Ireland is a bit of an exception. Andrew, you are nodding furiously there when we're talking about powers at the right level in Scotland. I think the, the idea of, is Scotland a single policy? Does it have a single identity or are there diverse identities within Scotland that need to be represented at different levels too? Uh, yeah, there are uh, actually. And uh, just listening to Daniel there, I mean, I agree with a lot of what he said. Uh, the one thing I did disagree with is that, you know, the idea that Scotland is you know, one single polity, as you put it, Matt, or, 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 or a coherent nation. I mean, the, uh, the, the northeast of Scotland, the highlands of Scotland, the islands of Scotland, the central belt, the borders, very distinct uh, regionally. And I would, you know, be much, uh, much in favour, actually, very supportive of what I would describe as real devolution down to a local authority level. If we're going to do devolution, let's do it properly. Let's give real people at a local level contro more control over what uh, really affects them uh, at a local level. I, I think Scotland right now is one of the most centralised uh, countries in Europe in terms of uh, power being held in a single central location. One of the issues that we've had, I think, as a UK government, uh, since devolution was created is that we've sort of stuck with the mindset that uh, devolution will actually uh, save the union will actually secure scotland's place in the united K kingdom it was lord uh, robertson of port ellen in 1998 i think during one of the debates on uh, creating uh, the scottish parliament that said devolution would kill nationalism stone dead it was less than 10 years later that the smp formed their first government in Edinburgh and uh, less than five or less than ten years after that that we had the referendum of whether Scotland should leave the United Kingdom so obviously that policy didn't work but but ever since then every government of every shade of uh, color uh, in Westminster has uh, proceeded down the route of we will devolve more and that will placate the nationals well you know we'll give them this and that that, that you know that will be enough um, we, we've learned to our cost that is simply not the case and we need to draw a line in the sand and say no actually uh, this is where it ends uh, now it's time to actually try and make this thing work because it patently isn't working at the minute and one of the things we need to do not taking powers back or in any way you know, conducting some sort of uh, power grab as the Scottish National Party would would make you believe one way is to make the union relevant I mean Henry hit the nail on the head when he said that you know, we don't have in many respects now um, a real British state so many issues that affect Scots and increasingly the Welsh on a daily basis are, are not discussed, debated or decided um, at a British level in Westminster. So much so that many of my colleagues from parts of the United Kingdom uh, that are not Scotland have no, no idea, uh, uh, haven't got the first clue about what's happening north of the border, what's happening in terms of education, what's happening in terms of uh, the health service, transport infrastructure, broadband connectivity, you name it, it's all decided in Edinburgh. So what we need to do is no, 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 end all this talk of a power grab we're not going to take powers back but what we have to do is get the uk government involved once more in affairs in scotland and involved once more in affairs in wales in such a way that people can see the relevance and the benefits of still being in a united kingdom now that's going to take some creative thinking and it's going to take some you know some probably uncomfortable discussions in whitehall where the devolve and forget mentality has been you know prevalent for quite a long time now it's a lot easier for civil servants uh, in whitehall to to to, to pass it up uh, to edinburgh than rather to have to deal with the issues that come from having to get involved in domestic scottish affairs but you know we're going to have those conversations we're going to have these meaningful discussions we're going to have to think outside the box as to how we actually make sure that people in scotland realize that the united kingdom government can work for them one very simple way of doing it and i, I you know despite what's behind me I'm, i wouldn't describe myself as much of a flag waver and what i'm about to say might be sort of contradict that slightly but one simple way would be to sort of demonstrate that the, 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 the money spent by, of course, it's tax, people's money in the first place, but money spent by the UK government actually benefits Scots. Now, right now, if you see one of the green boxes, the, you know, the, 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 the uh, high-speed internet across the country, you see the end of every, every street in the country, on that box will be, in the following order, uh, gra grants funded by grants from the European Union and the Scottish government working together and there'll be uh, uh, an EU flag and a Scottish flag. The next thing along will be supported by the Scottish government and a massive 
back in Great Salt Tire. The next, the next logo is BT, and the, th the fourth logo, I think I've got this order correct, I might have got the wrong way around, but the fourth logo is the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. Nobody, nobody has, a, has, a, has a clue what the Department for Culture, Media and Sport is. It should just say the United Kingdom government and have a whacking great union jack on there. And then people will realise that actually the reason that they're getting faster broadband speeds is because because of money given by Westminster, given by the United Kingdom government. It's a small thing, but it would demonstrate the relevance of this place and this government and the United Kingdom to, you know, the average Scot in the street. And of course, their fellow taxpayer, who's a... And of course, their fellow taxpayer. Around the <laughs> Can't let that one go without. Uh, Henry, is it, is it just symbols that we need? Or is there... What, what, how do we make the UK government relevant? Um, so, setting aside for one moment the retail politics of it, because obviously the tactical exigencies of winning a referendum are what they are. In the medium to long term, taking some powers back from Hollywood, and Cardiff Bay is essential. And if we're not prepared to do it, we cannot embark on this holistic uh, overhaul of the British state to come up with a kind of rational devolution settlement. Because every time this is proposed, it always sounds quite appealing. I mean, obviously I'm a conservative. I'm not really a fan of these year zero approaches to anything, but the idea of sitting down and sort of coming up at a big conference and coming up with a rational UK uh, internal settlement, it has its appeal. But that only works if you're prepared to critically assess not just what remains of Westminster's authority, but actually 20 years of experience of devolved government. You know, th this isn't a new experiment anymore. We, we know to a great extent how Holyrood, Cardiff Bay, you know, obviously Northern Ireland is what it is, um, but how Hollywood and Cardiff Bay have handled these powers. And you see this contradiction in proposals for just this kind of thing. So the Constitution Reform Group, which is Lord Salisbury's outfit, uh, produced a paper uh, for what they called a federal United Kingdom. And in their initial uh, paper, they, in their initial discussion paper, they said, we, we need a proper like root and branch review where nothing's gonna be off the table. And then by the time you got to their actual proposals, they said, every single, you know, nothing in the current devolved settlement will be changed. Everything will be left as it is. All of the changes are going to be with Westminster. And that's not sustainable. As unionists, we need to be prepared to say, actually, this hasn't worked. This hasn't worked. We, and this fits into a, what I think is a bigger problem with unionism, which is that for too long, unionism has just been about what we're against. We're against independence. And therefore, we've allowed ourselves to be sort of boxed into the position where we're for anything that isn't independence. We're obliged to pretend to be enthusiastic about the new United Kingdom and all of this confederal, confederal, Devo Max nonsense that keeps getting spewed out. For, for me, what I want us to start saying is that actually, we have our own aspirations for what we want the union to look like. We want a deeper and more perfect union of the peoples of Britain. And we have as much right to fight for that as the SNP do to fight for independence. And, you know, if we can, if that means that sometimes the, the movement is going to go the other way and powers which have been devolved are going to come back because we've won the argument for repatriating certain powers. We shouldn't be afraid to do that because if we, if we don't do that, then we create a, a, what, what Tam Diel described as the one-way motorway to independence because the only, room, the only room for travel and development is towards the nationalist endpoint because we won't argue for our own endpoint and our own position. And I think that's our big strategic challenge that we need to change as unionists. I always wonder about this in terms of the the way in which the United States has a debate has a it has a federalist side and it has a state rights side um, on both and obviously the two major parties historically have taken opposite positions on this. Um, Dan, you know, you spent time in Canada, which which you know has had its own fair share of debates about separatism um, with Quebec. And then also, you know, provincial realignment and resettlement on powers. How do we move to that more debate, that more mature debate about where's powers sit? And is it, or are we really on a one-way highway uh, out to uh, more and more breakup? It's difficult. I mean, the Canadians take a sort of similar approach to the Brits in some ways, where they just don't talk about it. One of Stephen Harper's great successes in his time in power was that he just refused to touch anything constitutional. Um, I'm sure a lot of our readers probably don't know, but Quebec has never actually signed up to what is the sort of de facto Canadian constitution. Um, it's still part of the country, but it, it's not a signature. That's, a, that's a sore part of nationalist history, isn't it? I think. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it is messy. Um, but I think going back to what Henry was saying, you know, we talk about these powers that have been sent out, but a lot of them are not, you know, big and glamorous. It's things like forestry, it's things like health, things like education, which anyone would want to be done at a local level. 
Um, and I think it's entirely sensible that, that those things should be handled there. But, but the question is, again, it's this issue of it being hoarded in Edinburgh and, you know, for the policing powers, things like this. Um, you know, the problem with, the, one of the problems we've had, and, and the coronavirus is a good example of this, is that there's an utter panic that there's different policies in Scotland and Wales to what there are in England. And I think that's just because we are very young and immature when it comes to having a sort of semi-federal system. When you look at the United States, when you look at Canada, where they've had 150, 200, 300 years of getting used to and finding a balance, they're totally acclimatized to the fact that you cross a state border and the rules will be completely different, the rules on alcohol, uh, the way things are policed. And it's a bit odd that, that we, you know, I think maybe there's an adjustment period where this is the first kind of major crisis. And, and it's the first time really since, particularly with Wales having, having gained primary legislation powers, where we've seen this kind of difference. Um, the other thing to bear in mind here is that when devolution was set up, it was set up by a Labour government and it was set up in, in two out of three countries where there was going to be a perpetual Labour government. So in a lot of ways, they didn't expect any divergence. They didn't expect things to be different because it would just be a Welsh first, a, a Labour first minister in Wales, a Labour first minister in Scotland, you know, have a nice afternoon chatting to Tony Blair and it will be fine and, and, and dandy. What we haven't adjusted to is the reality that that's not going, always going to be the case. And sometimes there will be other governments in control. I think the Conservatives have done a particularly bad job of dealing with the fact that the SNP are in power, that you do actually, while you campaign against them and you, can camp you campaign against their ultimate objectives, you do have to work with them. And you have to deal with the fact that they are in government, they are in charge of education, they are in charge of, of policing and work with them. But, you know, we're in this strange position where we've got a prime minister who, who won a referendum on emotion, on feelings, on, on nostalgia to an extent. And now suddenly he's on the other side of the argument where he's having to use money, he's having to put flags on things like the EU were. It's, it, it's a very difficult position. And that's why it sounds very wishy-washy, but that's why you find the unionist side of the argument saying, well, we need to find an emotional argument for the union. Uh, because it, it's true, it's, it's much more powerful than simply saying you're going to be broke if you, if you go independent. Andrew, is there a, an emotional argument that, that you would make? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's quite clear. The emotional argument is the success that we have achieved together as one nation. Um, the fact that many people in Scotland and Wales and England and Northern Ireland would describe themselves as British uh, and uh, Scottish English, Welsh or Northern Irish, we just have to look at our history to see what we've achieved together as a nation and also look at what we'll be able to achieve together as we move forward. Making the emotional argument for the union is, is an easy one. Um, the, the, the issue is that that, that, that that emotional argument has been fought and has been won by, by both sides. We are probably at peak em, 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 emotion on whether you're a unionist or whether you're a nationalist in Scotland. And that's why we're battling over what I would describe as the sort of the 20% the, the, the in the middle, that the head will overrule its heart on the issue of whether the United Kingdom should uh, stick together and whether Scotland should, should remain uh, in it. I thought Daniel's point was incredibly interesting on sort of the acceptance in some um, more established federal systems, such as the United States, Australia, Canada, in terms of having different uh, systems of government, different uh, you know, health, social care, policing um, uh, systems as you cross a state border. I think that the, di the difficulty with the exception and the difference with the exception of Quebec and Canada is that we are not working here with uh, a government or an administration in Edinburgh that actually wants to make devolution work. It doesn't want to make devolution work. It, it wants to, to stop devolution working. It wants to break Scotland away from the rest of the United Kingdom. And so that's the problem. We're not talking about, you know, crossing, you know, from uh, New York into New Jersey here. I and mean, neither of them are talking about seceding from the, the union. You know, we're talking about an organization, a government, in fact, whose sole aim, who's the, the number one, um, you know, I think, I think it's line one, paragraph one of their constitution is to advocate and campaign for an independent Scotland. So yes, it's very, very different. I think it's, it's very different to the way that the Labour Party assumed that it would, it would uh, progress. Um, you know, the, the arrogance of the Labour Party in the 1990s to imagine that the, the, simply by virtue of being the Labour Party, they would be in power in Scotland and Wales 
forever and a day and therefore everything would be fine and sorted out over a whiskey with Gordon in the back of number 11. And, you know, it's just, it, 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 it's, it's remarkable. And that's why the devolution settlement as it is, is so sketchy and has so many holes. And yeah, uh, could we have, as a party or as a government have done better in terms of, you know, making devolution work? Yeah, probably, yeah. Um, you know, I don't think any party is blameless in this. Um, but we, we do have to make it work. I mean, you know, we, we, the devolution is here to stay. Um, I don't think getting into an argument about taking powers back from either Cardiff Bay or from Holyrood is, is, is one that is, uh, um, you know, useful in terms of, you know, whether, you know, the, the, whether we should be sort of reframing how our constitutional settlement in, term, in, in, in the entire United Kingdom. As I say, I think the debate has to be much more on how we uh, work with the administrations in both these places, despite their uh, feelings towards the future of our nation, how we make the United Kingdom government relevant by thinking outside the box, thinking imaginatively, you know, thinking how we can actually maybe uh, force powers down to a much more local level in Scotland or in Wales. And actually also, um, you know, thinking about uh, what more we can do to just, you know, demonstrate the importance, as I said earlier, and the relevance of this government down here to your average Scot and of your average uh, Welshman. From my perspective, the easiest way that we can get into this debate properly and have a sensible grown-up discussion about how we actually might make the evolution work is actually making sure that the Scottish National Party don't win the election in May next year. Then we can have a sensible, grown-up and rational discussion with a party, a government of whatever colour in Edinburgh, whose sole aim is not breaking up the United Kingdom, but actually wanting to make devolution work. It might be a socialist vision, it might be a liberal vision. I hope very much that it's a conservative vision, but it's a unionist vision. And that's why we need to work very, very hard to ensure the SNP do not get a majority in the Holyrood election in May. So we can actually engage in this debate and actually have the discussion that Henry wants to have. I mean, we shouldn't be afraid of having this debate. We shouldn't be afraid of talking about where powers should lie. I personally, I don't think the Conservative Party certainly doesn't think we should be taking powers back, but let's, for God's sake, have the debate and the discussion. Otherwise, we're just playing at it. I think that's fair. I'm going to ask all three of you this because Dan brought up the dreaded B word, so um, it's, it's a fair game now, unfortunately. Um, the sort of the demographic split of how, who votes for Brexit um, and who votes for Scottish independence are nearly sort of like seesaw versions of one another, right? You've got a lot of young people who are pro-Scottish independence, but anti-Brexit. Um, in, in terms of pure, you know, taking a risk, going for an independent sovereign state, um, you know, not, not necessarily heeding expert warnings on what costs would be, et cetera, et cetera, they're the same thing. Um, and in many ways, a lot of the emotional arguments are exactly the same, just in reverse. So what's behind the reversal and the split of the demographics who vote for each one? Am I going to go to you, Andrew, first? Oh, God, like... I knew you would do that, Matt. I was just, <laughs> <laughs> just waiting for it. Um, I think it goes back to the, what we were saying uh, at the very beginning. It's all about emotion. It's all about, a lot of it's about heart overhead. And I think a lot of the Brexit argument was very much about heart overhead and about emotion, about how we identify as a people and what we see our country as becoming. Um, talking about powers, you know, returning back, uh, sovereign parliament, et cetera, et cetera. As, as you say, the arguments are very, very similar. And that's why we've got to win the argument of the head in terms of the, uh, our, our, our position in terms of the union. We've got to convince people that they will be, they will be worse off uh, in an independent Scotland. And, and they will be, you know, and, uh, and, and that's, you know, this, this, this is why we are focused so much on probably the, the less emotive arguments, because it is an emotive argument. And, and the nationalists, you know, they, they have what the, the, the Brexit campaign had, the campaign to leave the European Union had, uh, back in in 2016, um, you know, so it's 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 a very it's a very difficult one to answer because you're right. The, the people who won that campaign, um, the Prime Minister, uh, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, were deploying a lot of the same arguments for Britain leaving the European Union that Nicola Sturgeon et al. deploy for Scotland leaving the UK. But you know, we've got to deal with that. Um, yes, we've got to become a more exciting version of the Remain campaign, you know, and marry the heart and the head arguments, but, you know, drive home to people the real, the, the real facts that, you know, it, Scotland will be worse off as a part of, uh, out with the United Kingdom, as a country that isn't guaranteed by any means, uh, it's entry into the European Union. Um, you know, and, and at the same time, have the debate about, you know, how we actually make this union work, um, and, and touching on what, what Henry just said. Enough. And Henry, why do you think it is? 
So, I mean, I don't have any grand master theory uh, to explain it. I think th th there's an element to which it's probably become much more of a fact after the referendum. I th if you recall, during the EU referendum campaign, the SNP was really criticised for making a really desultory contribution, you know, in comparison to the DUP, which conversely was criticised for buying adverts on the mainland and really getting stuck in. One of the United Kingdom's most formidable campaigning efforts just didn't put the work in during the EU referendum campaign. And I think that since the outcome, you know, we've seen Actually, sorry, the rest just, of the United Just to jump in there and agree with Henry. Henry, you're absolutely right. The SNP spent more on the by a Scottish parliamentary by-election in the Shetland Islands than they did on the entire uh, Brexit uh, referendum in Scotland, which yeah, I, I think that's just remarkable. It was yeah, derisory. So, so, so I think, you know, and since, since, and since, the, since the Brexit vote, you know, it's become a counter-signalling thing. You know, we've seen in, in the rest of the United Kingdom people becoming much more Remainy than ever they were during the, the referendum campaign, just because it's, high, it's like the Scottish referendum campaign in 2014. It has created tribes, it's made people aware of different identities and coalitions. And so suddenly that lot, Boris Johnson, the English, the Welsh, uh, are Brexit, ergo I, as a, as a nationalist Scot, I'm, I'm not Brexit, and therefore it becomes much more pronounced. And I think the other thing, and this is one of the reasons that I was one of the kind of minority of pro-UK writers who was making what I, what a unionist case for, it, for, for Brexit, which I consider to have been vindicated sort of thus far, is that the European Union was always the easiest exit ramp for Scottish nationalism. Because as long as both an independent Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom were both members of the European Union, the floor for ongoing normal relations was very high. All of the things which you know, guarantee inter-EU trade, freedom of movement and all that, all that kind of thing, they would have applied between England and Scotland. And so that meant that basically the SNP could dress up uh, independence as a relatively low risk option because they'd be coming just another EU country. And a lot of the um, the divergence which now threatens in the event of Scottish independence and which I think will form a key part, acknowledging that we need a positive campaign as well, the divergence which I think will form a key part of any second referendum campaign wouldn't have been possible. So they recognise that actually EU membership or just the phantom, uh, the sort of the will of the wisp of EU membership is important to selling independence to that section of the electorate who are not died in the wool, will eat grass for a flag nationalists, but want but believe in independence because they think it will deliver a better, fairer, more prosperous Scotland. They need th at least the idea of EU membership to make that happen. Absolutely. Sorry. Um, I mean, also just to jump in there again, what we, we also I completely agree again, seem to tend to forget is that it's, it's, it's actually been quite recent in the SNP's history that they have become a pro-EU party. I mean, at, uh, through the 70s, 80s, and even early 90s, they were anti-CFP, anti-CAP, and anti-European Union. And it's only since, since they've cottoned on to the fact that, ah, you know, we can win sort of middle Scotland if we become a pro-European Union party, abandoning the fishermen, and to a lesser extent, the farmers, in their efforts to leave the CFP and CAP. I think it's really quite interesting. And a, li a little discussed, actually, um, point. True. Although I can't let that go by without mentioning the fact that it's very relatively recent that the Conservative Party became anti-EU and anti-EEC. <laughs> the reason that I became anti-EU. Uh, obviously, I, <laughs> I, I actually have that. a very strange one in this in that I voted to leave on the basis that I thought it would kill Scottish nationalism um, because I thought of that divergence. I thought that the slow, slow drip down and the slow, slow drip up uh, left hollowed the centre out. Dan, uh, you keep your finger on the pulse of the nation via your front box, um, sorry, your front bench newsletter every day, with the mo one of the most read newsletters in the country. Um, what do you want to say? Why, um, you know, what does the demographics look like for you to, to you? Well, so the EU thing here is key, and I think it's really interesting, which is that the SNP have managed to repeat a trick that the Brexiteers had, not the one that people assume about the emotional case, but that the SNP amazing, and this really is amazing, they managed to make independence and nationalism somehow seem like an internationalist, open, friendly cause. And that being an independent Scotland would actually mean going out into the world and joining the, the brotherhood of nations and, and making a difference. Um, and that's crucial because you do have a third of SNP supporters who are Leave supporters. Um, and they tend to sort of be quite similar to, to Leave supporters in England. But, you, but two thirds of them, and, and this is the youth demographic, are these people who see independence not as a as a narrow-minded inward looking thing but as an outward looking internationalist project and that's why the EU membership is so important and I think that to bring us back to, to Quebec again just because it's similar so they had a very very close brush with, with independence you know Canada had, had a brush with death almost in, in, in the 90s 0.2 percent of the vote and, and what's interesting is that since then Quebec nationalism effectively disappeared and, and they thought that they had demographics on their side because during that vote 
in the 90s, the youth were the ones who were in favor of, of, um, of independence. And what they thought would happen was that the future generations of young people would feel the same. Actually, in the aftermath, um, the leaders of the Quebecois sovereigntist movement came out as, as quite, um, quite xenophobic um, and said some, some pretty dodgy things um, about immigrants and, and money when it came to the referendum. But it meant that, that, uh, it meant that Quebec nationalism became branded as this inward looking, um, backwards looking movement, uh, very much associated with the past. And so the young generations of the future did not become nationalists because they saw Quebec's future as part of Canada, as part of, you know, part of the world, being able to travel, all this kind of stuff. So that's really part of the genius of the SNP is that it's one of the only nationalist movements in the world I can think of that, that claims to be international and not inward looking. And that's, that's their appeal to the youth, I think. Really interesting response. I think this sort of like thing for me that I, I'm sort of questioning is I kind of know what Sturgeon's narrative is going to be next time, right? Stability and, uh, you know, unshackling Scotland, um, freedom, you know, the classic Braveheart cry on the emotional side. Um, and then on the other side of the negative part, you know, Brexit with Boris and, and uh, you know, British chaos. And I kind of know what her offer is going to be. Um, even if she will have to sort of like fudge some of the more issues about the border and about, you know qualifications and who where you can work and what the negotiations would be like and what costs would be and pensions and all that kind of stuff. Um, but what's the big offer coming from the British side, or what should the big offer be from the British side to try and win over the generation that they currently are not winning? And I'm going to go to you, Dan, and then I'm going to go to each of you. That's a difficult one. I mean, the you know the the Conservative Party has not chosen to pursue a youth uh, tactic um, in, its, in its attempts to, well, its successful attempts to govern in Westminster. And I think that's, that's you know, that is a big difficulty that uh, the, there isn't an immense amount of overlap between the sort of Southern English conservative um, heartlands and, and, and people who are tempted to vote for independence. Um, I mean, the, the big offer, it's it's difficult. I mean, you know, like Andrew's saying, we're, we're competing really for the twenty percent who who are thinking with their with their minds and not with their hearts, right? Um, and I think if that's the case, really, it's about destroying ambiguities. To be boring and bang on about Quebec again, one of the reasons it was so close was that the the, the federal government didn't know whether to campaign against the legitimacy of the referendum and to suggest that it wouldn't immediately result in independence and whether to take it seriously and warn, if you do this, it'll be a disaster. And they had the same arguments about the Queen, about the currency, about the army. Um, I think it's, it's about, well, it, it would be nice to make a big grand offer. There's not much left to be devolved. And so I think the answer really has to be about removing any ambiguity whatsoever um, about what um, an independent Scotland would look like. I wouldn't necessarily embrace this idea that was, that was this kite that was flown by James Forsyth, that you try and negotiate the terms before you allow a referendum. I think that just doesn't work. I think that plays directly into Nicola Sturgeon's hands. Um, yeah, Henry, you hated the idea of this uh, free negotiation. Give me, give, me, give me your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was one of the most mental propositions that I've seen flown as a kite from a government in, in such a long time. I mean, well, it wasn't from the government. Well, 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 yeah, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> okay, okay, sure. Yeah, close, so, so maybe, maybe James Forsyth dreamed it up himself fine i don't think that's the case but whatever um you know basically what this would have done is it would you know i get the principle I, the principle is that you know given that we're no longer going to be part of the european union separation is going to be difficult let's spell out how difficult we did that in 2014 you know we had we'd have george osborne rock up and say you can't share a currency and all of that that's fine as far as it goes but the idea of actually staging the negotiations to try and have a final settlement ready we, it, it, it's difficult to really count the number of ways in which it's a bad idea. So the first thing is it removes actually all the ambiguity around independence, but it means it makes it look really plausible because instead of, instead of being able to say there are these hugely complicated topics, it will end badly. Let's not go there. We're like, well, this is, this is what it will look like. This is the deal. So the SNP can sell it and it would involve years. It, it would, it would give the nationalists, the SNP credibility. They would literally be negotiating for Scotland with the British government. It would leave the Scottish conservatives and all of the other unionists in an impossible position because they'd either have to be cheering against Scotland um, to try and get a bad deal or they'd be you know boosting the SNP against um, against Westminster so, so no that was an extraordinarily 
an extraordinarily bad idea. Uh, and, you know, the, fundamentally, you do, yes, you need to spell out how difficult it's going to be. But this is the problem. This what do we do? What's the offer is, again, the problem with the sort of Devo Max slash Union Min approach, because, you know, there's the money. Fine. But the money's not enough. So what else do you do? Well, the union doesn't really do anything. Um, you know, ideally, we'd be able to say, oh, vote for the union because the union will, will deliver better hospitals. It will, it, will, it will solve problems in education. It will give you more opportunities to do X, Y, and Z. And currently, if you declare er whole areas like health and education and everything else to be absolutely outside the union's remit uh, and outside the remit of Her Majesty's government, you're just left with the cash and the cash isn't enough. So actually, I think this is one of the reasons that we do need to start saying maybe it doesn't involve taking powers back, at least not now, because that's tricky. But as Andrew said, we need to start finding ways of saying you really care about healthcare. Here's how being in the union helps healthcare. You yeah. really care about education. Here's yeah. how being in the union helps education. What we absolutely can't do is go into a referendum campaign promising to give away yet more powers, no, basically agree. agreeing with the SNP that they need that, that Scotland would be better off with less of the United Kingdom, yeah. and then yeah. dressing up that nothing but the cash as the best of both worlds. That's so, Andrew, what do you think? In no, I, I on, on, on that last point, Henry is absolutely right. We, 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 we cannot and we will not. Firstly, we are not going to have a second referendum. The government's absolutely clear. The Prime Minister has said it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But if it did happen, we could not go into that referendum promising to give away yet more powers. As Henry has already said, and I, I think I repeated earlier, you know, we've, 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 we've practically given away all that we could give anyway. So there's very little more to give. And it's not stemmed the tide towards, uh, you know, increasing support for separation thus far. So, you know, why would it in the future? You know, it's, it's beyond me. You talk about the cash. One thing that we could do is actually start making a better job of explaining, you say the cash is not enough. Well, the cash is what is delivering uh, those schools, those hospitals, those roads, the, the hospital in Edinburgh that still hasn't opened, the road in Aberdeen that was two years late. You know, those things that, they, that you know, the, the reason that these things are getting built at all, if, you know, in a flawed uh, in, managed in a flawed way, thanks to the Scottish government, is because of the United Kingdom Treasury and the pooling of resource. And and by the way, a phrase that I'm sure doesn't go down very well in the Adam Smith Institute, the Barnet formula, um, you know, it actually actually helps build and, and, and create all of these uh, infrastructure projects that support uh, Scots in their daily lives are doing a better job of explaining that the money that is spent by the Scottish government is actually as a result of money getting given to them by the United Kingdom government and the UK taxpayer as a whole helping Scots. One of the other things we can do, something I feel quite passionately about, is actually start making the case for global Britain. And I know it's this phrase, nobody really knows what it means or what it is, but Dan spoke, uh, you know, about how the, the nationalists in Scotland are unique, almost apart from maybe the the, the separatist movement in Catalonia, for creating uh, an, a nationalist movement that is outward looking and internationalist. And if you vote for a for a Scotland, an independent Scotland, you will become a, a, a full member of the international community. We'll join the European Union. We'll take our seat in the United Nations. We'll do great things in the world. Well, why don't we talk about what great things in the world the the, the United Kingdom does? I mean, why don't we start talking about? Yeah, okay, Erasmus is great. Fantastic, how I met my wife. But you know, we, but why don't we start talking about deals that we can start doing with you know higher education institutions in the United States of America or in South America or, or you know or, or in Asia? You know, why don't we start talking about the great things that you could do uh, as a Brit? You know, uh, you know, you know, going abroad, uh, investing. You know, the, the the huge work that we do in terms of international development, the great pride we have in our armed forces and what they're able to do across the world. You know. The, the, it, all of this stuff, what it means to be British on the world stage, a truly global Britain. I think for far too long, for the last, well, four years, especially since the European uh, referendum, we've been, we've been navel gazing as a country. We've been looking very inward about what the future for this, the, well, these islands actually means outside the European Union. We've got to start looking up to the wider world and actually think, actually, what can we do on the world stage? And what does that mean for British people uh, living in the United Kingdom today? What what, what will they enjoy thanks to being part of what a truly global Britain? We've got to start putting flesh on the bones of what global Britain actually means and see some real exciting dynamic uh, policies. For example, the one I just threw out there, do, let's, let's, let's have an, an, a, an equivalent Erasmus with, uh, with, 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 with institutions in, in the nor, 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 northeast of America. Let's, you know, let's have a similar one with uh, institutions in Japan and South Korea. You know, and you can be a part of this through being a part of the United Kingdom. You can study in, you know, Seoul, whatever it is. I think that's, that's just one area that we could sort of look at. And that's something that we could offer and say, this is what you get. This 16-year-old 
first time voter from from Aberdeen. It's what you get if you if you vote to stay in the United Kingdom, a truly global Britain, unlike an inward looking uncertain uh, Scotland who does not know. They do not know what the future of an independent Scotland would be in outside the EU European Union. But we do know what global Britain means. This is what we are for. I like that. I mean, like, I can't look till I'm blue in the face. So, uh, and I would, I would suggest that it's a good offer for, for young people to have. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions that we've received in uh, from various people. And I think we've sort of, can't, we've, we've just covered Gerard Matthews, who's asking us for actions and policies to make the union more robust, less fractious and not least more leveled up in the sort of parlance of the Conservative Party nowadays. Um, but well, there's a few like problem or challenging ones, things like this, and uh, what sacrifices should we as Brits be prepared to make for the Union? Uh, Canada itself adapted completely to get Quebec to feel comfortable in Canada. Should England expect to change, to become more Scottish in order to retain Scotland in the United Kingdom? And I'm going to give it to Henry first. So I think, not, I will answer the question, but I just want to slightly push back on the premise of the question, which is that the, the, there is often Canada is held up as an example of where kind of the retreat to victory strategy actually worked. But really, if you look into it, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, a lot of part of the dynamic of what, of, of what and, uh, eventually undermined the Quebecois constitutional strategy was the fact that Canada, the rest of Canada, as they ended up being called, got sick to the death of what they called knife at the throat politics, which was a, which was a quote from an, an original uh, Quebecois nationalist. And there was Meech Lake, which was supposed to be this big holistic concession to Quebec, the Meech Lake Accords, and that collapsed. And people said that after that, Canada, you know, Canada would, would fall apart, and it didn't. So it's not just a one-sided um, one -sided story. Yes, Canada has not so much adapted the rest of Canada, but it has given Quebec an awful lot of leeway to be Quebec. Um, that's fine, it works to an extent. I think there are, if you're familiar with the government of Quebec and the, the rule of the Parti Québécois, I genuinely think there are questions to be asked about the extent to which that was a good idea. The Parti Québécois, even though their separatist ambitions have, 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 have gone into abeyance, they're running a really nasty nationalist regime in Quebec uh, with really well, they're, prescriptive. They're, they're not policy. in power at the moment. It's, it's, well, they, well they, but for a long time they were. I know, they, 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 and the, you know, their language the and cultural assimilation policies were really unpleasant. And so I think if you're trying to govern a long term, a policy for the long term, it's always possible, I think, to make short term concessions which prevent this defeat. But ultimately, if you're trading away your constitutional integrity to win the next referendum, that's the equivalent of selling assets to cover costs, right? It's a path towards bankruptcy. And I also, and I, I should have, I wanted to mention this earlier, I think there's always a danger of comparing us too much with, with, with federal systems overseas, because the United Kingdom, all of those things have to be placed in their proper sort of cultural and, and geographical context. Canada is a, is a continent-sized country with many federal units, all of whom have a long history of working together. I don't think there's really an example, the closest you can get is the USSR, and it broke up, of a federation or a quasi-federal system where one member entity was as much of it as England is. Mm -hmm. And I think therefore there are additional tensions. It's relatively easy to ask 50 or 49 states to adapt to one state or several provinces to adapt a bit for one province. But I think it gets much more complicated when you're asking one very big country to make too many concessions uh, to, a, to another one, especially when we know that the SNP are using, are going to use every single one of those concessions to try and rile up English voters and undermine support for the union over here. So we do need to be careful not just to defend the union in Scotland, but to defend the union in England. And we can't do that, frankly, if the union comes to be understood as a series of endless concessions. Dan, I think you described yourself, I think, maybe as an idiosyncratist, uh, that you can't compare country to country because of unique circumstances. What do you think of that? Do you have the same opinion? Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, Canada's very, very unique. The, the continent size thing matters. You know, Quebec is from Quebec City, which is the very the sort of French speaking heartlands to Toronto is nine hours by train and car. You know, it's the same. So, you know, we're talking about something very, very different. Scotland is much more integrated, just even in terms of transport than, than, than Quebec. I mean, and also Canada tried to adapt to Quebec. Uh, it was collapsed partly because of Quebec, partly because of um, some of the Western provinces. And ultimately the problem went away because people stopped talking about it and cultural attitudes shifted and the Quebecois population became more diverse and less interested in, in nationalism. I think the issue um, 
with England being dominant is, is a big one. You know, the flip side of devolution is that while it gave Scotland and Wales sort of a greater sense of identity and, and power of themselves, it did to an extent revive English nationalism, patriotism, whatever you want to call it. Um, but there hasn't actually been a response to that, apart from sort of the odd feeble attempt like evil, uh, things like that. There's not really been any attempt to kind of respond to this English desire for, for self-determination, if you like. And, and I think that that is unhealthy in itself for the union, because when English voters, when English citizens want something and, and demand something, um, it can end up looking like they're browbeating the rest of the union because England doesn't have a government. Um, I don't think the answer to that is an English parliament, but I do think that part of the answer may be greater devolved power to English regions, um, giving them a greater say, because when you yourself have a regional body uh, that has a say over certain things, I think the would be feel less aggrieved when uh, Scotland, for example, has has a say over, you know, Scotland has a say over how it spends its its money and is able to vary income tax, um, you know, or demands more money for for um, for healthcare. That's a problem when England doesn't have its own system separate from the United Kingdom. But if there is a devolved one in your region and you can say, oh well, it's okay because the northeast got a decent settlement, so I don't mind that the Scots also got money. Um, I think that would actually go a long way to kind of easing the tensions that, that maybe exist and maybe that sentiment that England would be better without Scotland. If I could just come back on that very quickly, I think this loops back to something I said right at the beginning, which is about the importance of having a British national identity. Too many of the kind of, not, not this proposal, but a lot of the proposals I see from some of the more radical devolutionaries, they forget that you can't bank on a system that ex assumes the existence of a creature called the British taxpayer if people don't keep feeling British. If you want to continue to win support for fiscal transfers between different parts of the United Kingdom, that everyone needs to feel like they're all part of one common polity and one common conversation. So try if we, I, I worry that if we end up balkanizing things too much the net response will be frankly that the English voters they won't have a national uprising or anything like that but they'll just stop feeling British. And the moment that English voters stop feeling British, eventually uh, the support for fiscal transfers to other parts of the United Kingdom will evaporate. So that's why it's really important. Yes, we do need more devolution within England. No, we absolutely do not need English national institutions. That would be a stake in the heart of the union. But we also need to put in more of an effort to have British conversations and British policies so that people remember that actually, when money goes to a different part of the country, it is a different part of the same country. It's not going abroad. Yeah. No, absolutely. And that's, I think you're absolutely right, that English institutions is, is a no-go, but uh, regional ones, I think, are important. And Andrew, do you think that unionism has become too associated with the right? Your party monopolises the unionist position in Scotland in opposition to it. But uh, like, let's be honest, the Labour Party is very much struggling in the polls north of the yeah. border. Um, and the Liberal Democrats are still nowhere to be seen anywhere. So um, is, is, there, is there a left-wing case that can save the union as well? Yeah, I think... It's kind of difficult territory, really, I suppose, because as a Scottish Conservative, we obviously want to uh, be seen to be, do, or we obviously want to do well uh, in every election we fight, and that involves fighting against candidates from the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats. I mean, the failure of the Labour Party to put together a coherent policy on the union is actually one of the huge um, uh, difficulties that we, we have, um, because there are, you know, some places that the, the, the Conservative uh, message and conservatism just cannot sell and so we need a strong uh, left-wing argument for remaining uh, in the United Kingdom. However, um, it's not my job to uh, reform, reorganise, re-energise or give ideas to the Labour Party. They need to sort it out for themselves but I wish they'd bloody well hurry up and do it because time's running short. I mean this is the, this is the party of uh, Robin Cook, Alistair Darling, uh, Gordon Brown, Donald Dewar, John Smith. I mean, if you can't make a coherent and sensible left-wing uh, 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 argument for the, for the union with a history like that of great unionist labor politicians, then, then, then I really think that they are in, in a very, very difficult position indeed. I do worry sometimes, despite the fact that I rejoice that the Scottish Conservative Party are the official opposition in Scotland, are obviously the strongest uh, unionist party in Scotland, and I think the only party that can truly stave off uh, further SNP gains in much of Scotland. I do genuinely worry that we don't have a left-wing um, uh, 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 unionist uh, argument that we can deploy. Because as I said, there are going to be people in Scotland that will simply not vote for the Conservatives, Conservative and Unionists, uh, not because of the union argument, 
uh, and would, may actually come to us because of the union, but because we are conservatives. And so that is a problem, but it's a problem that the Labour Party themselves are the only people that can sort. Mm. Dan, you work for a wishy-washy organisation. How do we come up with a left-wing party for, for the union? Left-wing of the union. I mean, just a slight aside, um, when uh, Andrew is listing off sort of Labour Scottish grantees, there is a slight uh, lack of uh, Scottish Tory grandees at the moment, um, for obvious reasons, sort of lack of Conservative MPs for, for, for many decades. But I think that <laughs> doesn't help that the uh, doesn't help that the government, the British government, doesn't sound very British. You know, it, it, Michael Gove, a few others aside, it sounds very English. Um, you know, left wing argument for the union. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, you've seen the kind of the infighting going on with the Labour Party at the moment. You know, oddly the Scottish Labour leadership is sort of the last outpost of, of Corbynism um, and you know that's we'll see how that goes but 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 Labour's not going to be revived in Scotland while that's the case. I guess part of the problem is that the SNP have, have somehow managed to you know sometimes see that they're accused of being sort of two-faced you know present one attitude on on the in, on the west coast and another on the east that they have somehow managed to both appeal to Tory type voters uh, middle class Scots and then also to working class left wing Scots at the same time. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately the failure there is just one of, of basic politics that the SNP have just not been held to account for um, the pretty shoddy way that they've run the country for the last 10, 15 years, whatever it's been. Um, and, and I guess part of the problem is, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier about how we're not quite used to devolution yet, is that there are not many talented politicians willing to stay in Scotland, willing to stay in Wales and willing to work in what are seen as minor parliaments. You know, Ruth Davidson is sort of the exception that, that she stayed there and did a fantastic job. But if you're a big, powerful Labour beast, you don't stay in Edinburgh and you don't work hard to defend the union. You come down to London. Um, what the solution to that is, I don't know. I mean, part of it is probably boosting the Scottish Parliament and pointing out how many powers it has. Um, so, you know, a bit more devolution in that sense, but, but I certainly think that that is a, is a major problem. Fair enough, fair enough. I mean, as a, as a Welsh person who left Wales, uh, <laughs> I, I haven't got much of a leg to stand on on that one. Um, although I am off to Scotland next week to, uh, to, to Edinburgh and maybe to Glasgow as well. So I can, maybe I'll, maybe I'll that's ask. Not, that's not real Scotland, Matt, you go further north. I always I go to Angus on the regular. I go to Angus on the regular. I've never been to Aberdeenshire. It's my it's my failing. It's, it's the next one up. It is. <laughs> it's, just, it's just an extra hour on the train, Andrew. Yeah, that, is like... that is true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just sort of to finish, I think that it'd be, it would be nice. I think to to remember that the you know some of some of the other parts of the United Kingdom's family, the British family that exist overseas, um, whether that's Gibraltar or the British overseas territories. And also British expats that live overseas and, and, you know, the security of the United Kingdom behind them. Um, will they get a say if there is that? Obviously, I'm saying, Andrew, there's not going to be a referendum. I know that and so on and so forth. Um, is there, is, is there going to be some wrangling maybe over the question? Would there be some wrangling over the question? Would there be some wrangling over the electorate? Uh, make sure that Scots abroad and Scots in the rest of the United Kingdom are represented in this referendum that's not going to happen? I think it was one of the greatest mistakes of, and, and I speak as a Cameroon, a fully fledged card carrying member of the David Cameron fan club. But I, I, uh, I think it was one of the great mistakes of the, the Cameron government to allow the Scottish uh, government to choose the date, the franchise uh, and the question uh, in 2014. I mean, it's just ceding all control uh, over the referendum to the opposition. I'm not quite sure uh, what the decision making process was. Uh, there and I'm not going to get dragged down the rabbit hole of uh, talking about what the franchise might be in a referendum which is never going to happen because I've noticed that members of the government have found themselves in awkward positions over the last couple of weeks for doing just that um, but what I will say is that if there is going to be another referendum we will should never again be in the position where we allow the the, 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 the opposition the the party that you're fighting against to set all three uh, major stipulations as to uh, and decision and, and how and have you know, a, 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 every control over how the question is asked, who answers it, and when it's going to be put. Uh, we can never let that happen again. Dan, what do you think uh, on that? Uh, and we'll finish um, up. Uh, I mean, generally, in terms of the other parts of the union, sort of slightly shaky term. I mean, speaking to Fabian Picardo um, 
who's in power in, in, in Gibraltar and, and they're angling for members of the House of Lords. Um, they sort of see that now that they don't have a say in European Union laws uh, through England, um, they're going to be much more exposed to uh, British laws on, on finance, for example. Um, you know, when Philip Hammond raised the, the online gambling tax, that, that had a big impact on Gibraltar. So he, Picardo is sort of angling for members of the Lords. Again, it's this kind of typical of you know, Britain's unwritten constitution. There's not really an answer to how you give representation to these places, um, but why not do it in the unelected chamber where they're appointed? Um, I think, I, I don't think that there is a, a, a decent argument to be made for giving um, residents of the rest of the United Kingdom a say on Scottish independence. I think it'd be very, very difficult to um, make any kind of political argument for it. Um, and also, I don't think it would necessarily help. I think there is actually, unfortunately, quite a strong sentiment in England that wants to get rid of these of Scotland because they see it as 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 a burden. I think it's tragic that they exist, but I don't think that even if you could expect expand the franchise in that way, um, it would necessarily go the way that you would expect. Henry, what do you think? And maybe the, what about uh, Scots who? a resident in other parts of the UK and didn't realise they were living in a different country, should they be allowed to vote for Scotland's future? Um, I definitely think that David Cameron's strategy in 2014, I mean, when I read this bit of his uh, autobiography, it made me want to chew off my own arm in frustration of simply conceding to the SNP on everything in the hope that it would make it as decisive as possible. That manifestly didn't work, and the British government should be much, much more muscular. One of the arguments I made recently in print is that, you know, if you want to if you want a, your position to not look nakedly self-serving, then you do need to lay a lot of the intellectual groundwork for it in advance. So I think if the British government does want to not enfranchise everyone, although the great A.V. Dicey did propose a UK-wide referendum on Irish independence, um, but to you know, enfranchise Scots, for example, who live in other parts of the UK, you, know, they, you need to do an awful lot of groundwork for that. So I think the, the, your routine would be to ask the SNP, you know, what would your, what would the grounds for citizenship be of an independent Scotland? You know, who'd be eligible to apply for a Scottish passport in the event of separation? And then give them the vote. You know, you could try and turn that SNP argument back on them. But ultimately, to be blunt, the, the British government should be strict. This is, on the, the, the constitution is reserved. This is the British Parliament's prerogative. It is not for the Scottish Parliament to set the question or the timing or the franchise or anything else. And my default position would be that we should say it will be fought on the general election uh, it will be fought in the general election franchise. You will not be adding 16 year olds. You will not be adding EU nationals or anything else. And, and let's have this out on that basis. Interesting response. Well, thank you very much to all of you. Um, thank you very much, Andrew, for joining us and Henry and Daniel as well. This is a debate that will roll and roll and roll as we end up in Welsh and Scottish and London elections next year. Um, and no doubt will be a hot topic of every single show. So we thought we'd kick it off. But uh, thank you once again, uh, and thank you all for joining us as well. Uh, join us next week uh, when Morgan will be leading the show. Good evening. Thank you.